All right, thanks you guys for coming today. Um, great turnout and I'm really excited to see you here. Um, today's session is on how to take your academic research and turn it into a publishable op-ed. Um, we're very excited to have a guest presenter, Thaler Picard, with us today. Um, this workshop is part of our Lunch and Learn workshop series, which is new for us this year. So um, after the fact, we're going to ask for your feedback, and we'd love to get it from you because we're hoping to do this again probably next year. We want to make sure it's as useful and impactful for you as it possibly can be. Um, today, we actually have a number of our former scholars joining us online, which is really exciting. We've never done that before. Um, so Linda Cooper, who's sitting in the back, will occasionally be interjecting some questions or comments who come from them, uh, that come from them, but uh, the people in the room are going to be our priority, so please, if things occur to you along the way, Thaler will be more than happy to answer questions and work with you directly, so we're really hoping that this is helpful to you. Um, Thaler is a globally renowned in the field of narrative, story, and persuasive communication. Both the BBC and the Smithsonian Institution have hailed her as one of the world's leading experts on organizational storytelling, and the United Nations High Commissioner of, for Refugees has institutionalized the use of her award-winning video on LGBTI refugees in South Africa. Thaler is known for her ability to guide smart leaders and institutions in finding stories which have reached millions of people across multiple communication platforms. Her team at Thaler Picard and Partners has worked in 18 countries on five continents, directing people on how best to be heard, understood, be influential, and guide people and institutions in hearing others. Please join me in welcoming Thaler Picard. Voices, a lot of different people who are, who are writing these days. Um, the fourth most read op-ed in the New York Times last year was by an assistant professor in the social sciences, a sociologist, and that was the fourth most. The top three were from uh, movie stars. <laughs> so that makes things a little different. I have, and you can look at these later, a couple of uh, New York Times Sunday op-eds sections and a couple of Wall Street Journal sections that really show you the incredible diversity uh, of who is writing and what op-ed pieces look like these days. This is a really short program. I mean, obviously, as you know, your work, you've spent an entire career working on uh, developing your expertise. We're going to spend a very short time today, but I promise you, you will walk out with an idea, if not a full outline of an op-ed that you're going to write. I'd I have my expertise, which is in communication and persuasion, and I'm going to offer up an outline for you to use that'll be highly practical. You have your expertise. Um, you may be able to answer questions for each other that I'm not even able to answer, and I want to make that clear that even though I'm standing up here and I have this mic on me, uh, this is all voices are to be heard today, and I, I want people to jump in. One of the great things in terms of starting today and having this outline is that it's really helpful to start putting your ideas down and organizing them in a way that you would bring them out um, into the press because you never know when a news hook will come along, um, when there's something timely in the news that enables you to get your op-ed into the paper. So it's good to have something drafted that you can then go in and tweak uh, to hook on to whatever is the current news. If you're writing about infrastructure issues, and we just had this horrific bridge collapse, um, if you're writing about New Jersey economic issues and you've got a new governor and a new uh, state, um, a state of the union address that he did the other day, or state of the state address, uh, there's a way to hook it on. There was a uh, editorial, I wanted an op-ed, that was recently published from a professor of mathematics at the University of Winnipeg. And this was uh, published um, in the Canadian paper. And it starts out, Ontario's Education Quality and Accountability Offices 2015-2016 results from mathematics assessments should give parents of the province reason to worry. There was some positive news in that reading and writing scores increased over five years, but mathematics scores plummeted. The percentage of grade three students who met the provincial math standard fell to 63, blah, 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 blah. 
Um, but that headline was Ontario's math system is broken, so why isn't government fixing it? Something that was uh, poised and ready to write and was reactive to a report that came out in the news. Um, so it's just more fodder for why you should uh, start writing something out. So the first thing I want to have you do here is I want to make a case for, uh, for story and for some, some anecdote and some story sharing. And I'm going to ask you to start out, you know, we're also going to use this exercise to demonstrate a few things. And for those of you on the, um, who are listening in, play along with this in your head. I'm going to have people in the room here turn to each other, preferably turn to somebody on the side of you that you don't know all that well. And I'm going to ask you to share a very short story, no more than three minutes, about, and, and even if it's two minutes, that's great, about something that you're wearing or something that you're carrying. So it could be a piece of clothing, it could be your eyeglasses, it could be socks, it could be jewelry, something that you've got on. Um, and I want you to tell a story about that. And I can start out, I'll, t I'll give you an uh, example. I'll tell you a story, two years, it'll be two years at the last Friday in April. I was in San Francisco, it was a beautiful sunny day, and I went out and I got my first tattoo. And uh, you can't see it because the, the big lesson to be learned is when you're middle age and you get a tattoo, it should be really big because everyone you know wears reading glasses and no one will know what the heck a small <laughs> tattoo is. Um, but it is a Sure 55 microphone. And the reason I got this is because it's about my work, which is helping people to hear and be heard. It's in homage to my husband, who is a very accomplished blues harmonica player and plays uh, through this very microphone, and he's a sound man. Um, and uh, our best friend gave us exactly this antique microphone, and every New Year's Eve, we massacre karaoke through it. So it was one little image that, to me, uh, showed off the many different sides of me and the many people that I am. So I'd like you to, right now, just play with me in this exercise and turn to somebody that you're sitting next to and share a story about something you're wearing, something you're carrying. You won't have that opportunity uh, when, you're, when you're writing, but it's this trust that I wanted you to see. I wanted you to see two things there, and that's that trust is vitally important. We are measured by our expertise and by our warmth. But people don't stick around to see how warm they are, how expert you are, if they don't first find you trustworthy, if they don't first find you warm. No one's going to give a hoot about your expertise if they don't trust you as an expert. And so it's vitally important to build trust with your audience. I also wanted you to see that in many cases, what you heard were stories that contained values, emotion, complex stories about family, about self-image, about work, um, and that if we were going to ask for all of that data to be written out, it would take page after page and bullet point after bullet point. But a story is a container for a lot of complexity. And it's a container for values, information, and facts all in one small package. And it immediately invites your, list, your reader into what you're writing about and helps them connect it to their own world. So a story is very, very powerful. It also helps simplify all those values, facts, emotions, feelings, those statistics, and puts it into a small, easily digestible and not dumbed down package. And if there's one thing that we know, it's that people don't mind complexity. Life is really complex, and life is really chaotic, and people like having that acknowledged to them. They don't like elitism, and they don't want people coming at them and saying, I know more than you, so you better listen to me. The better thing to approach people with is saying, we've had this kind of experience, or I've had this experience, maybe you've had something like it too, and here's where this expertise and this opinion 
fits in to this, let's talk about it, let's go on this journey, journey of discovery together. I want to read um, the opening of an op-ed that was in the Boston Globe a couple of years ago, and it was written by an associate professor of math at Cornell. In honor of being here today, I just tried to find as many uh, opinion pieces written by mathematicians as I could. Uh, social scientists weren't as hard, um, but the mathematicians, and there was a lot of them, which is really nice. Um, so this is the opening of uh, her op-ed. If my seatmate on an airplane asks me what I do for a living, I tell the truth. I'm a mathematician. This generally triggers one of two responses. Either I'm told I must be brilliant, or I hear about the person's inability to balance a checkbook. The truth is I'm not brilliant, just persistent, and I hate balancing my checkbook. Both responses, however, point to a fundamental misunderstanding about what mathematics is supposed to do and its current and unfortunate trajectory in American education. Little anecdote, I trust her. I wouldn't necessarily read an op-ed about mathematics, but I'm really terrible at balancing my checkbook, and now I've been invited in to read about very specific issues about mathematics education. So facts alone have no meaning. Right? Facts alone, it, it's the why that you have to get to, and stories support that why. And that's evidence-based. So for those of you who are pushing back and saying, hey, we're scientists and we're all about evidence, right? Story is evidence too. It's your evidence and it's completely valid. And if you are, what you are doing in an op-ed is you're selling change. And that might sound kind of mercenary, but you are. You're selling a change in a situation. You're asking for someone to change their behavior. You're asking at the very least for somebody to pay attention to something they might not have paid attention to, to think about something in a new way, if not actually take action. Some of your op-eds might be asking people to vote a certain way or spend money or take a certain behavioral change. And so inviting people to take that action and enabling them to see themselves and their possibilities and the role that they can play in that solution is vitally important. There's too much data coming at people. Right? It's, we're, newspaper readership is somewhat down. It's up when we talk about clicking through articles online. And if you're writing an op-ed, you're going to want it to go viral in the sense that you want people to push it out there through social media channels. Um, we all have, many of you had your phones out, and I appreciate that some of you have put them away since we started, but we have so much data coming at us all the time. We don't need more data. Your work is all about taking data in. Your job when you're writing an op-ed is providing meaning to people, providing an invitation to them to understand their meaningful role in the solution that you're offering them to play. So it's kind of like thinking of yourself as this meaning-making archaeologist. You have to think about your opinion and all the data and the evidence that you have to support it, and how are you going to invite people in. I'm going to give you an example from another uh, op-ed from a mathematician. Um, and this is a gentleman named Jordan Ellenberg, who's a professor of mathematics at the University of Wisconsin. And he wrote, he, um, he wrote a book recently, How Not to Be Wrong, The Power of Mathematical Thinking. And this is a story that he has in his op-ed towards the close of his op-ed. There are many things we'd like to coach our kids to do, and we can't help playing favorites to some extent. I'll admit, I, I'd rather CJ, his son, aim to be a mathematician than a shortstop. I tried to open his eyes to some more realistic careers that could still satisfy his hunger for the major leagues. You know, I told him, you really like math, and all the teams now have people who work for them analyzing the players' statistics. You'd probably enjoy that. At this suggestion, he became agreeably eager. Daddy, that's a really good idea, he said. 
because almost all major league players have to retire by the time they're 40. So then I could get a job analyzing the statistics. Right? It's charming, but it helps make the point, and it makes him trustworthy. It makes the op-ed memorable. Um, and so what you're trying to do when you write these op-eds as scientists is to change your, your listener from a passive listener um, of scientific information to an active participant in scientific discussion. They're not going to be sitting with you in the academy having that level of discussion, but they're going to be talking about that op-ed with, with other people. They're going to be acting on that op-ed. And so I want you to think about story as providing the heart of your op-ed. So just hold that piece, this idea of the heart and the, the emotional um, setting, the, the part where strategy and influence and opinion all come together are in that story. And I want you to think for every single thing that you write, there's got to be a reason for it. There's a reason you're putting it out there. And we all know if we talk to somebody and we blather on for 20 minutes and we don't have a purpose to that, we're being disrespectful. There's a reason we're talking. All communications is a, mean to an, a means to an end goal. And your writing an op-ed is certainly a means to an end goal. So when you start out, think about what is it you want your reader to do as a result of reading that. Do you want them to call a legislator? Do you want them to talk to their kids about math in a new way? Do you want them to ask their, uh, their family members about their experiences in the Holocaust or their political experiences with a certain regime? Do you want them to think about math in a new way? Think about what it is you want them to do. That's critically important because that'll also help you figure out where you're going to publish this piece. So is it for another academic audience? Is it for other experts in your field? Is it a more mass audience? Uh, you're going for parents, or you're going for uh, suburban, suburbanites, or you're going for people who have kids in the public school, or you're going for uh, people whose great-grandparents are Holocaust survivors. You want to think about where <clears throat> where you want to publish it. And there's so many options these days. You have gotten or will get a link to uh, 50 different top uh, newspapers in um, North America and the addresses for submitting op-eds to those papers. And that's often what comes to mind immediately, is where do we put things in a newspaper? Although the experience in this room is fantastic in looking at different places as well, and different uh, academic journals as well as different outlets. And even major newspapers themselves have different opportunities. So the New York Times, we think of the opinion page, but online they've got a fixes column, which is about solutions to social problems. They've got the Private Lives, which is personal essays. There's the Stone, which is a forum for contemporary philosophers and other timely issues. The Couch is a series on psychotherapy. I mean, we, you might not know any of these exist. I didn't know that the Couch existed. There's something called Draft, where people write about writing. This meta op-ed, where people can publish opinions about the actual writing process. Um, and then there are online opportunities like Quartz, which is an online, uh, and they have, they do a lot of international writing. Uh, the Guardian takes opinion pieces that they don't just publish in their physical printed paper, but they publish them online as well, and they help target international audiences, uh, specifically even UN audiences on The Guardian. There's a wonderful publication called New Scientist, which is uh, a magazine published out of the UK, which is a much better version of a popular science. It's a weekly, and they publish pretty wonderful opinion pieces. Um, Al Jazeera exists. Project Syndicate exists. There's something called 
narrative.ly, narratively. Uh, that's personal essays. Them versus Us, which is a queer-friendly online uh, site that you could publish. And then there's something called Medium. Has anyone here ever published or read in Medium? You could raise your hands. You've read Medium. Medium, anyone can self-publish on Medium. And it gives you a wonderful ability to uh, put something up and send it out to people. I've, in fact, put things on Medium just to see what a reaction might be, and then tweaked those essays even more for a, a real, I shouldn't say real, there's no real or false, but for uh, a, a more juried outlet that I would go to. But Medium, if, if you've been rejected or if you just want to put something up quickly or you want to reach a mass audience, you put it on Medium and you hashtag it. You are the media. There's the, there has been a revolution. The gatekeepers are gone from the gate. It's been overtaken. And you can publish lots of places. And you can self-publish as well. Um, but think about what you read. And think about who you want. And don't just think about the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the leading uh, journal in your academic field. Think about who really needs to take the action you want them to take and where that can happen. So that's what I want you to think of as the hand part. What are you leaving in someone's hand at the end of your op-ed? What are you asking them to do? And there has to be something that they have, either a new piece of information or ideally an ask that they can go and do something. It's actually something tangible that you're going to leave with them. And for those of you who are thinking, whoa, you're talking about stories and you're talking about emotion, there's still a head part to this op-ed. And the rationality makes sense, and emotions alone and stories alone aren't enough to propel action. We need data points. But you have to give those data points after you've established that trust and after you set the context for what you're writing about. Don, Don was asking about uh, length and how long a piece should be and how you balance story versus content. Um, and also, uh, if I can correct an understanding, that claiming that op-eds are not about action but about understanding and using an example of one about Afghanistan and saying we're going to be in Afghanistan a lot longer and get used to it. So I would say there is an action there, which is th get used to it um, in, a, in a crude way. At the very least, the action is you're asking people to think about something. And that's the very least that you're doing, is think about something in a new way, consider something in a new way, be critical about the information that you hear about Afghanistan coming in, because I want you to look at it through this lens as opposed to the current lens. So that's the, the very, very least. And that's a very helpful thing. When you think about that, it helps you figure out what it is you want to say. I want you to imagine, um, let's say I, uh, I run into uh, Kelly in the, in the hallway. And Kelly says, hey, did you see Tim had an op-ed published in the New York Times today? Isn't that great? And I say, wow, good for Tim. What's it about? Whatever Kelly answers, that's the only thing you get to talk about. So you might think that your op-ed is about all of these different data points and all of this expertise that you're putting out into the world. You don't get that opportunity in 700 words or even in 1,000 words. You get to say one thing. And I find it really useful to do this, what would somebody be saying about me to someone else test? You, know, you could really make yourself uh, suffer and say, oh, what's my sibling going to tell my mother this op-ed was about, right? <laughs> and then, then you're really forcing yourself to do some hard thinking about how it's going to be summarized. Um, 
Or how would my kids, how would my teenager summarize this to his friends? But that's all you get. Try that test before you figure out what it is that you're actually going uh, to write about. So, and when you get to this data, this, this head part of your piece, think about what's the minimum that people need to know. The biggest problem I see in my work is the experts that I work with think that if I just do a data dump on you, if I tell you everything I know about this topic, you're obviously going to feel the way that I feel about it. But nobody has the time to hear everything that you know, and everything that you know fits into your worldview and your world experiences. Nobody can comprehend things in exactly the same way. Minimum viable, in, in product development, people talk about the minimum viable options. And you need to think about the minimum viable data that somebody needs. You could think about three points, and then I would ask you to even get it down to one. What's the one thing that people need to know, the one piece of data or statistical information? And here's another math op-ed. Um, this is by, uh, um, uh, G. V. Ramanathan, and this was published in the Washington Post. This was, how much math do we really need? We need to ask two questions. First, how effective are these educational creams and gels? With generous government grants over the past 25 years, countless courses and conferences have been invented and books written on how to teach teachers to teach. But there is the evidence that the, is there evidence that these efforts have helped students. A 2008 review by the Education Department found that the nation is at greater risk now than it was in 1983, and the National Assessment of Educational Progress math scores for 17-year-olds have remained stagnant since the 1980s. Second question is more fundamental. How much math do you really need in your everyday life? Ask yourself that. And then he goes in with with statements and, and opinion. There's one fact, one piece in this entire op-ed, and that's the study. And it's a wonderful, wonderful op-ed, and I can send this to, uh, to you after, if you want to take a look at it. Um, but it's just one statistic that he found that was able to help prove and, and be enough of a core for the entire piece. So you do need to put in quantitative data, um, but you also need these qualitative pieces. You need the story, you need the anecdote, you need the how does this fit into our lives, you need the, to provide the meaning piece of it. And for those of you who think, oh no, it's quantitative only, it's not one or the other, right? You would never, a, an artist doesn't use just one spectrum necessarily. There's black and white, right? There's, you're using a full array of colors here. And you're not presenting on one end or the other. You're melding the two together. And both are very equally important to your writing and to your persuasive argument. And reasoning is incredibly important, but it's the emotion that leads to the action. And so you need to put both in any piece that you're writing. And so I want you to put this all together. If you've noticed, I've, and you've gotten the handout already, I'm talking about using a three-step process called heart, head, and hand. And so heart is setting that emotional context for the piece that you're writing. It might be with a story. It might be with an anecdote. It might be a strongly he held opinion. Uh, a way that to look at something, but somehow you're letting, pe you're letting your readers know that this is how you can think about this. It's emotionally grabbing them. It's telling them where to put this information. Because if you put out a piece on immigration, there's many different places where I can process that data. When I hear immigration, there's a lot of different places in my brain, and you want to start that synaptic pattern. You want to start leading people down the path to get them to the hand, to the action that you want them to take. Yes? Were, were you raising your hand with a question? Sure. Uh, 
One thing that has not been discussed that is very important is why you want to place an op-ed. So you have mentioned all these uh, newspapers, but for instance, my goal is to flip Congress. It's totally useless for me to put op-eds on the New York Times, on the Washington Post. There are have tons of op-eds which haven't write it. So, uh, so the question, the very important thing, is why do you want to write, to write an op-ed? And once you know why you want to write an op-ed, where would it be uh, the best place to put it if you wanted to flip triple opinion? Okay, so I'm just saying that uh, many things depends on what your goal is. Yes. Uh, including where you want to put it. Yes. Putting one in Missouri is more in a local newspaper in Missouri might be more valuable than putting it in the Washington Post or in the New York Times. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up your local paper, which if you're a trusted person in your local paper in the, the Rocky, what's the Rocky Hill, the Rocky Hill record, or, um, you know, use your voice there if you know that you can move people to take the action that you want. So that's the hand piece, the what is it that you want them to do. That's the hand. Why are you writing this? What is the motivation for your writing piece? And then the heart piece and then the head piece is the data points that you're putting in as well. And you want to make sure that there isn't confirmation bias, that people don't push away your op-ed about immigration or your op-ed about genocide, your op-ed about math or economics because of confirmation bias or incestuous amplification. That's what the military used to talk about. Uh, confirmation bias, they use the term incestuous amplification, which I love. Um, uh, but if your op-ed is solely on facts and statistics, people are going to take one of two actions. They're going to agree or they're going to disagree. And I think you can all be more nuanced than going for agreement or disagreement. You want to go for movement. You want to go for looking at something a new way, putting a new lens on something, or actually taking an action where you're going to vote a certain way or not. Um, you also, I think ahead of time, but you'll get afterwards, this op-ed that I talked about, um, why the rich are different than you and I, which was the fourth biggest op-ed, uh, fourth most read op-ed in the New York Times last year. Uh, take a look at that, it's incredibly long. It's about 1,600 words, 1,700 words. And so it's too long for us to look at now. But take a look at that and notice the structure of it after you leave this class. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Let's wait for the mic. Sorry for the delay. Yeah. So um, you were saying before that you know you need a kind of story, you need a heart and so on. So my question would be is that you know, we live in an age now of social media. I think it's fair to say maybe since social media, people are far more cynical about op-eds and you know they'll see who the person is and what they what their tags uh, and they'll. And so I'm just wondering, is I, I've, I've definitely read op-eds where someone starts with a nice kind of, you know, heart wrenching or whatever, and actually that kind of works against the op-ed, because says, oh, please, this person, look who they're writing for. You know, particularly on a kind of a fairly controversial, maybe political science-related question or history question, and actually it can kind of work against them, because people actually become maybe more cynical, because they think, well, this person's trying to, you know, pull my heartstrings, and I, I kind of don't need that, and da, da, da. So I'm just wondering how that kind of advice fits in, you know, bearing in mind that people are maybe more cynical, more skeptical than maybe they would have been. You know, because people are less deferential, and people are less kind of willing to say, well, this person's a professor, or this person works the Atlantic Council, whatever it is, you know, for a lot of people, that's kind of, it'd be like a trigger, and they'd just be like, well, yes, I'm just... And I know that there's... Personalizing things can become very political within the academy and could really work against you. And certainly for the women in the room, if you write a highly personalized story, that can work against you. You have to find your voice and you have to understand. And I also want you to know that when I talk about story and I talk about emotion, I don't necessarily mean like you know, emotional crying and sobbing and pulling at heartstrings was your term. but making it clear that you're pissed or you're happy or you're outraged 
and you're inviting someone else, being clear, taking an emotional stand. Um, you're passionate about your work. And an op-ed is not a place to be impassionate. An op-ed is a place to let that passion out for the people that are feeling the same way as you. Do not target the opposition. It's a waste of your time. You can target the apathetic, which is the hardest to target. A apathy is much harder than, than opposition. Opposition is going to be more interested in reading your piece and driving your red numbers up in social media because they do want to attack you. Uh, but the apathetic is who you want to reach and who you want to move. But it's really important when you're talking about action that you target the choir too. I was a huge West Wing fan, for those of you who remember this American show about, um, about the presidency. And there was a great line where he says, why are we preaching to the choir? And Toby says, to get them to sing. And that's, you want, if you're, especially if what you are advocating is on the side of, you have the vast majority with you, then rally them. Get them to take action. Don't talk about the opposition, but, but rally the masses and get them excited. Give them words that they can use. This is why the, the rise of conservative and right-wing media has done so well in America. They're, easily putting words in people's mouth that then they can go out and go to a dinner party or go to the golf course and repeat what they've heard. Again, we're going to get out of that elitism and make things uh, simple. Take the complexity of people's lives and make it work for them. So you have in front of you a worksheet. Uh, it's on the back, the last, it's the last stapled page to the handout that you got. And this helps you through the heart, head, and hands piece. And it helps you uh, write out who it is, what, what is it you want people to do, how do they need to feel to do that, how can you write, what story do you have, what data points do you have, what solution are you offering to them. And I want you to work on that. We're getting tight on time here. So what I'd like you to do is jump ahead uh, to the last section. Jump ahead to that last question where I say, think about a three sentence and a one sentence. And this is hard. I'm not kidding you, but you're geniuses. Um, and uh, I, we're just what? Persistent, yes. Um, I have a good friend who actually got a genius award and she always told the story that she went to, there was one gathering where they brought all the MacArthur winners together and um, there's someone in this room, right, who's a genius, is there a, no, I thought there was, um, and she said someone walked up to her and said, oh, are you the sister of so-and-so? She said, your sister's a genius and they all laughed because the sister wasn't there in the room. Okay. All right. Um, Look at that last, that three sentence, that two sentence, that one sentence, and play with that. I'm going to give you a few minutes. Think about that. If, if I were to walk up to someone and say, oh, I missed it, Agata? If I were to say to Casper, what was Agata's op-ed about? What are you going, what do you want him to answer? So take five minutes now and fill that in, and then we'll shout those things out. And here's a bonus question to that. If it can answer, wow, or hmm, to Donald's point, if that sentence can make me go, hmm, I never thought about it that way, or if it can make me go, wow, how cool, what a cool idea, what a cool ask. So see if you can pass the wow or the hmm test. I'm going to open up. Does anyone have their one sentence that they would like to share? The, the, the summary. Does anyone have a summary? Uh, yes. Aiton. Yeah.
going to ask you to use the mic. It's for the absence of street dogs in U.S. settlements is an outcome of systematic, non-stop, and massive massacre. Systematic, non-stop. And massive massacre. And massive. Massacre. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> and massacre. I'm massacre. very sorry. Okay. Wow. That's a wow. Wow, that's what, thank you very much. That's incredible. And as someone who does a lot of traveling in developing nations where there are a lot of street dogs, you, I'm immediately thinking of it. I want to invite the people who are listening in as well, if uh, they want to share and type into the chat box um, their uh, summaries of their op-eds, if they want to share them with us as well. Anyone else here? Yeah, Rory. Do you want me to take it and run around? It's how I get my cardio. <laughs> okay, it's not, it's not a very interesting op-ed, but it's what I can't So my, my op-ed is, is I think Western governments need to stop supporting uh, governments that um, deny the Holocaust just because it's politically expedient to do so. Great. Great. Wow. Is someone else? A summary of what they're going to? Yeah. Great. <laughs> so the argument goes like this. Many Spaniards are insatisfied because electoral results are not proportional as mandated by the Constitution. This creates problems for the Spanish democracy. Electoral results in, Sp in Spain are, in fact, much less proportional than in other countries like Germany, in which the Constitution does not include the word proportional in, as, in its description of the electoral system. Party leaders interested in increasing the proportionality of electoral results in Spain should consider resorting to the Constitutional Court if the parties that actually benefit from the disproportionality of the electoral system are, mm, do not agree in changing the electoral legislation. Do you have any idea where you might want to publish that? I have actually published it. You have published <laughs> it. OK. Well, well, and to those listening in, this is Alvaro speaking. Uh, I'm telling those who are listening in, I, I already speaking. published it. I was just recalling uh, and summarizing the argument. But I published it in Spanish. <laughs> and what was the response like? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm considering to send it directly to party leaders. To In Spain, they are discussing to, uh, to mayor, but not the two larger parties. They are discussing about changing uh, the electoral system. And I... I'm thinking of sending the article to them. But what I argue is that in Germany, the Constitutional Court changed the, the electoral law, and they could try to move the Spanish constitutional law to do the same, because there are arguments in the constitutional text to do so. Great. And you touch on a point, which is after you have your piece published, there's a whole um, what you can then do with it, how you can send it to party leaders and how you can use it, which it, when, when you all get a piece published, I'm happy to help you think that through, as I'm sure your PR department here is as well. Anyone else wanted to share that? Yeah, Marta. I have a very short title, and it's How Abusive Police Are Comparable to Pedophilic Priests. <laughs> I, I think by the response in the room, you need to write that piece. <laughs> Uh, I think you've got a readership here. Um, anyone else want to share a summary? Tim. China's overseas acquisition of oil and gas resources is globally a threat to national sovereignty. Great, and that's U.S. sovereignty? Or you, globally a threat to... Fantastic. Fantastic. Write that. Yeah. So, as I said, I'm very uh, interested in uh, flipping Congress, 
So I, if I have to sum, and I give uh, in this art, in this op-ed, I give uh, uh, reasons why it's important. And so summarize the op-ed in three sentences. This country, its institution, and the average American are in a huge crisis. And uh, uh, we need to act before it is too late. You have the power to do so. Vote. OK. Are there anyone online, Linda? Any questions online? Any questions here in the room or more ideas that you want to share? Yeah. Most new drugs approved by the FDA have few or no advantages for patients and bear significant risks of serious harm. Wow. Wow. And have you, you want the data? <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have your one or two data points that you can put in there? Powerful stories. And, and there is an example of, to get to the question about emotionality, I imagine you can put a story in about somebody who was harmed. You can probably find a story, but it's, it's kind of hard to you know, tell a personal story when you're making such a, several of them. Um, like the, ma the massacring of street dogs is really interesting. You probably have a personal story, maybe, but maybe you don't. I don't know. Question about the, the, I mean, you're working with hand hearts. So maybe, so maybe I should first, uh, I don't know, listen to what you've said. But I'm trying to figure out what's the difference between argument, data, the one sentence thing. Is that an argument and a like? What are what kinds of different sorts of text are there? For instance, you talk about stories, and I think about anecdotes as a s social scientist comfortable area, but I think you want something different. I mean, with an anecdote, I often open a chapter, and I, I hope people will read on, but I think you're looking for a different type of text or a different kind of connection, so I'm trying to figure out what is the different, I mean, we, I think we all have our uh, fallback options or where we feel comfortable, so when you say data facts or something, I think, okay, you know, I've got three historical examples. I mean, that sort of sounds like data to me. It is. Um, but I wonder if, you know, how my scientific inclinations with text, how we, how I, or what I need to do to turn it into this op-ed thing. So especially, for instance, with a, what you call a story, I'm thinking like as a historian, I have lots of stories, but I'm not sure if we mean the same thing by story. If any anecdotes, that's kind of interesting does or thank you when i say story i mean seeing something happen to someone or, or something but i wanted you to play with story here to see that you have a non-complex you have mind you you have a rhetorical power that can take the complex and make it simple that I wanted you to play with story here to understand the emotionality of it. Anecdote is fine. It sounds like you're doing a fantastic job writing these chapters when you think about the start of every chapter has an emotional invitation. And then you invite somebody in and you present the data. I would say that you probably could even look at a chapter that you have now and probably edit it down and have a great op-ed. So we're, we're not in disagreement. I think we're very much in, in agreement. I just want you to, to understand that idea of um, laying out the emotional doormat in some ways that's inviting somebody to step across the threshold and find their place inside the op-ed that you're writing to find out how it can serve them. And to that point, I encourage you. I mean, the, the pieces that I heard now, these short summaries, these are fantastic. And this isn't, it's a different kind of writing than what you're doing in some ways, but you're talking about this. And if you, my goal was to give you 
a outline that'll help you take that passion that you're often talking about and feel comfortable putting it into a written piece and sharing it with the world. You have my contact information on these, uh, on the handouts. Ask me anything. Uh, if you're driving home today and you've got something still lingering in your mind, please reach out to me. It's the only way I get better at what I do is to keep getting questions from people and knowing what sticks and what doesn't stick. If you publish something, please let me know. It would give me tremendous joy. More importantly, if you write something and you want help in editing it, I'm here to help you do that. And that's part of the agreement that, and the contract that we've signed here. I am available to you to help you uh, edit an op-ed and to get it, uh, get it ready for publication. So you have my contact information and I really want to hear from you and I really look forward to going, wow, and hmm, and thinking differently. And uh, I thank you, especially those of you who have never done this before and didn't really know what this was about. Thanks so much for coming and thanks to the folks that are online. <laughs>